Wagons are kind of my thing. So it's no surprise that when a rare green E61 chassis 5 Series BMW comes up for sale with a $950 buy it now, clean title, mechanical loss, you know I'm buying it. Like, I, I gotta have it. I already, actually, I already have one of these. So why do I want two? Well, actually, I don't want two. At some point, I'll be selling my dirty daily driver. I've had this car for several years. It's pretty well modified. I love this car. There's just a couple things I don't love about it. Number one, it's not green. Okay, that's my favorite color for this chassis of car, and it's also one of the rarest. Number two is this is a 2008, and the green car is a 2010. And there's a lot of things a 10 has different than an eight. And I know this sounds like totally dumb, but I don't want to do all the work to convert this car to a 2010 spec when it's not the ideal car. The other reason that I wanted the green one is at some point I planned on converting this car to a manual transmission and converting it from all wheel drive to two wheel drive. And if I'm going to go through all of that work, I might as well do it to a car that is the perfect specimen as such. I've got my new balances on, so let's talk production numbers. They brought about 4,100 2008 to 2010 N54 powered wagons over to North America. That includes Canada and Mexico. And I would say 2008 is the most prevalent year. And then, of course, everybody knows what happened in 2008 for the 2009 model years and 10s. Uh, we had that big economic crisis, so they didn't sell very many luxury cars. And in 2010, that was the final year for this chassis and the final year that BMW brought a 5 Series wagon to North America, which makes me really, really sad. Really sad. But 2010 is obviously the least common year. They made them in diminishing quantities as the years progressed. So this is a 2010, which has some nicer features than the earlier models, mainly the infotainment system is a lot nicer than the next generation. And it's also a really rare color. Now, there are rare colors, there are rare cars. This is an automatic, it could be a manual. I think there's 328 manual N54 powered wagons that were brought to North America. This is not one of those. Those cars typically bring a lot more money. However, I'm okay swapping it because I don't want to spend more for it and then inevitably work on it again because that's what N54 cars do to you. So I haven't been underneath the hood of this car. I really, the only experience I have with this particular car is just pulling it inside with my forklift. And I knew a few things from the auction photos. Of course, this is the BMW N54 B30, the 300 horsepower twin turbo inline six that never has any problems. Okay, that's a, that's a lie. They, these are not for normal people. I knew the bolts were out of the engine cover. And it looks like it's all assembled outside of that. It's really dirty in here. Uh, it has, at least that's an index nine injector. So it's had injectors put in it at least once, probably more. Still has a serpentine belt, which is, uh, that's a plus. It's also really corroded in this area. It looks like this car sat for some time. Now this has the Dakota Brown interior, which I do like. It's not tan, I'm not a big tan interior guy, but the black and brown looks pretty good. Unfortunately has the base style steering wheel, which I'll be changing anyway. But the interior looks okay. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be some broken stuff in here because it's a BMW. Now these cars do have rear air suspension. So another clue that this car's been sitting for a while is it is completely deflated, which is why it looks like I've got uh, a whole bunch of parts in the back, which I don't, it's empty, I think. Now this car had a mechanical loss at, as of claimed at the uh, auction. This came from IAI. I have not tried to start it. I have not even powered it up, but I did know that it has around, I think, 130, 140,000 miles, which is okay. I, mileage is almost irrelevant because I'm not planning on selling this car. And everything that could go wrong with high miles, I'm going to have to address anyway. So let's see what happens here. Well, we have power. Well, let's power it on and see. Let's see here. Oh, cranks? For a lot? Cranks for a long time. So it, the motor's not locked up. It actually sounds pretty healthy. Okay. Well, now we need to figure out why. 
a uh, bunch of warning lights on the dash. It's normal for BMWs to do that. Uh, see, 137,000 miles. This has the newer infotainment system, the CIC, which I did not want to go through on my 2008. That's a tough conversion or expensive, depending on how you look at it. Okay, let's see if um, see if the power hatch works. These never have problems. It never. Okay, maybe it's locked. Let's try that. Um, hello? Do something? Oh, there's a button. I'll go press the button over here. No, that's no. Oh, cool. Do I have to just hold it down? Oh, we're just going to go a couple inches at a time. Oh, it sounds like it's low on fluid. I think that's all the way up. Yeah. Okay. What do we have back here? Oh, no. Ah. Oh. Well. Ah, oh, what in tarnation is this? This looks like something somebody made with wood screw. Where was this screwed in? Oh God, what have I done here? It looks like this had a audio system. Not for you audio guys. I am not making fun of you. That's your thing. It is not my thing. And we all know that there are certain levels of quality for installs. And it appears this is on the lower side of the spectrum. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, there's... What is, what is in this? Oh, no! Okay, well, I'm just going to show you what's going on here. Because it's ugly. This is some pretty thick cable. And then the next thing I noticed is there's a trash bag which has all of the trunk floor electronics in it. Now these cars commonly fill this basin filled with water, and okay, this is all of the modules out here. So I don't know if this was a, um, this could have been, you know, preventative or reactive. This is not, I, that is not, let's just pull this whole thing out of here. There's got the power hatch module that's made of unobtainium. That's just gonna have to stay there. But then we've got some fused stuff, wires. This is all getting ripped out. Anything that's not original. And then this. Yeah. Don't like that? Nope. Got my scan tool here and I'm just going to do a complete body scan I actually have a game I play with my friends that work on cars, and we call it DTC High Score. So far, my S65 has won for me. I think it had 140 codes in it. Normal. Uh, a lot of low voltage codes, which is totally normal. This car could probably beat it. And this is going to take, uh, take some time. We're just going to let that hang out here. Get the car on a uh, battery charger, and we're just going to let it do its thing. Well. It's not done yet. It's 25% done and we got lots of red. Nothing is good so far, but that's also because the battery was dead. It's going to be a lot of low voltage codes, probably a lot of old codes in here. I don't think, oh man, there's just, there's nothing okay. Let's see if something is okay. I would be happy if I got some parts of this car without codes. This thing is running every module in the car. I was taking a peek here and that's a no-no. It's just an oil line. It's not like it's under pressure. So, if hopefully that's not the level of repair this car has seen. Well, as you can see, lots and lots of red. It looks like uh, very few things are good. It's fine. It's fine. This is totally normal. I don't think this has over 100 codes in it, or maybe it's close to it. But first, let's go into the DME, which is the engine control unit, and let's see what's in here. Read codes. I don't want to go erasing anything yet. Okay, oh, there's a violation in here. 
battery, low fuel pressure, misfires two and three, injection, cylinder, misfire cylinder one, five, All these codes are quote unquote not present. So these are all old codes. Um, power management, closed circuit, current violation. Something's angry. It's probably going to need a fuel pump or a fuel pressure sender, fuel pressure sensor. We're just going to delete all of this. Oh, cool. And it needs a water pump. It's got a water pump code in it. So this just. Um, Let's just delete this. So we don't know what's current and what's not. So now we're going to read codes again now that it's not doing anything. Okay, no fault codes. Active tests. See if we can do some stuff here. Fuel pump. Activate. All right, low pressure pump kicked on. It does say I've got nine miles to empty. It just means it ain't got no gas in it. What else matters? Fuel pump control. Here we go. EKPS. Go to it. Do it. Do the things. Read codes. It had three faults in it. Voltage too low, control current too high. So voltage too low is a present code. It's that's uh, that's battery related. It only had two codes in it, so we're just gonna erase that. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out so we can see if this works. All right, now that I've cleared some codes, let's see if it uh, cranks and starts. I have my major doubts here. It does not. Let's see if it threw some more codes though. Read codes. No fault codes detected. Liar. All right, so let's look at some fuel pressure stuff. All right, now I've got rail pressure pulled up, so we're gonna crank it. See what rail pressure is while cranking. Not enough. 1200, okay. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a lot higher than that. Here's a view of live data of the instrument cluster, and as you can see, tank sensor one, zero gallon. Tank sensor two, point three six. So it is a good chance or there is a good chance that this is actually, it ain't got no gas in it. Let's put some gas in it and see what happens. Okay, got two and a half gallons, three gallons in it. Let's see if it starts. It doesn't, and I heard the fan turn on, which is not a good sign. So here's the rail pressure. See what happens when we crank it. Oh, 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 do it. Well, it's doing stuff. That rail pressure is still way too low, but it is climbing. Come on. Don't want to kill the starter, but. We're getting somewhere. Well, all we did was put gas in it. And it probably needs a high pressure fuel pump. I can hear that fan going. Yep. That number is too low. That's about half of where it's supposed to be. That's uh, Hector Pascals. And that's supposed to be somewhere around uh, higher than that. I don't know exactly the exact spec, but I remember that being low compared to where my blue car is. Well, I don't know if you can hear that, but the cooling fan is on high. And if you couple that with the fact that the rail pressure is low, tells me that this probably needs a high pressure fuel pump. Now, where could I find, oh look, a high pressure fuel pump. I guess we're gonna put this in and see what happens. Right, the very first thing I'm gonna do is remove the air box. Here's where the high pressure fuel pump's located. It's right uh, right on the side of the block there. We're gonna remove the charge pipe, at least loosen it, and then take the throttle body out of the way. That way it's nice and easy. And it clearly looks like somebody's been in here before. The T30 that holds the charge pipe to this bracket, deleted. Oh, a speeder. Okay, that's mostly out of the way. I just have a few tens on the throttle body. Probably take this off here. Magic. Oh, it's full of oil. That's okay. 
Will you? Will you? Will you? Can, can you just... That one connector's really fighting me here. If I could just get that disconnected, I'd be so happy. Oh, cool. It has a triple-tested remand alternator. That's going to not be used in the build. All right. That's plenty of room. Okay. All the bolts are out. Might as well just take the throttle body out. It's just got a couple connections here. crack the fuel lines loose. Hopefully it doesn't make too much of a mess. That was nice and easy. There's one electrical connector and then it looks like there's just uh, three of the Allen bolts that hold it on. Fuel lines are off. Now we just have the uh, electrical connector on the actual pump itself. Oh, the gas smells terrible coming out of this. Okay. That's disconnected. We're three bolts away. If we can get these cracked loose. One. Back one is always the most fun. Since it's a five millimeter hex key, I should be able to slide a five millimeter socket right over it. In my brain, that's how that works. Okay, that doesn't work that way. Let's get one size up. I have much better sockets at home for this. Some long wobble sockets. I would have made short work of this. Oh yes was the sound of happiness. All right, one bolt left. That's it, it's already loose. Should be easy. Should be easy. Easy. Pump removed. Well, here's the two pumps. It's a bad pump, it's a good pump, bad, good, good, bad. Wait, nope, this is the good one. I can tell because that one's still full of fuel and that one's dry. Let's get the dry one in and make it, wait, no, we're not gonna say that. Gotta feel how that is in there and it is in there. Like a glove. All right, now we just gotta get some bolts in it. Let's get this one, not snug, but run down a little. Oh yeah, I'm in the right spot. Just gotta get the threads, on, threads going and we're, we're on the home front. Home stretch, home front. Stretch. Now I need to plug some things in. There it is. One, two, three. Now I gotta put the throttle body back on. Put all the ducting back together. Well, we're back together for the most part. Got the charge piping back in, the air box in. Nothing too crazy. This is not really how I would repair my own car because I saw a whole bunch of things wrong oil leaks when I was in there, but I'm just trying to get this car mobile so that it's not beached at my house. Just want it to drive on and off a trailer or from one driveway to the next. I guess we'll see if she runs now. It's almost worse than it was before. Not a good sign. Did I just put another bad high pressure fuel pump on? It's possible. Oh boy. Well, we have a new problem here. That's gas. What the heck? This is going outside tonight. I can tell you that. I'm not leaving this in my shop. And I also noticed that this was loose. Has this been messed with? Uh, we're going to have to pull that up and find out.
Here's where the fuel's leaking. You can see there's a bunch of fuel on the tank. That housing it gets brittle and cracks, or maybe it's just coming out of that fitting. We're gonna key on, see if we can prime the pump, and see if we can see fuel spraying from that. I'm gonna leave it on for you guys. Let's try, let's see what happens here. Let's see. Well, that's not even installed right. Well, that's why this whole thing hasn't been installed correctly. It's loose. What in, what the, who's been in here? Let's see here. Why, oh why, would you do it this way? This has been replaced, I can tell that. This all looks like it's in pretty good shape. It's just, what, what the, but, well, that will definitely do it. I've got a tool that'll tighten this down. And I guess that's what we'll do. We'll pull this line out of the way. We'll tighten this thing down. And we'll see if it changes anything. That is absolutely preposterous. Let's see, and it could be that they have a bad seal in here. We'll try that after. First, I would like to, uh, you know, just try to tighten it. I think that's probably tight enough. It's not loose anymore. Let's see if it uh, does anything. I have my doubts that that will fix it, but that certainly wasn't good. All right, this is probably not gonna do anything, but we're gonna try it anyway. Nope, that didn't work. It was pretty easy to spot where the fuel leak was coming from. The passenger side sending unit was installed incorrectly. It was super loose. However, do you remember when I said it had no gas in it? Well, it turns out it was full. And I put enough to fill it all the way up, which is why the fuel leak started in the first place. Which means that someone had this apart, obviously, and they did a pretty bad job at it. But let me show you what else I found. I went ahead and pulled this all apart. And this is a replacement basket. So obviously someone's been in here. The first thing I noticed, well, once I sucked about 10 gallons of gas out, uh, there's nothing attached to that. So that's problem number one. The second problem, which I don't know if we can see that on camera, is one of the siphon jet lines is broken. And then it was kind of cobbled together. You, you can't really, you, you can't do that on these. Now, where could I possibly find these parts? Oh. Here they are. This is everything I need. First, let's get the uh, driver's side sending unit out here. There's not really too much on this. There's just some hoses and an electrical connector and a float. It's not too crazy. Hey, come back here. So that, that was disconnected. And then we have one connection here. Come on now. Pull this up. Okay. Here's the driver's side. Now the fun one. Right, let's get into this side and see if anybody's been in here. Uh, what? Why is the O-ring here? That doesn't go in that order. You, the, this can't seal if it's not... Who worked on this thing? Like, I'm all for DIY, but God, I hope this wasn't a paid job. Okay, let's get this. That's supposed to be in, okay. 
whatever. We'll get it fixed. Just let the seat belts hold that. Perfect. Lock ring off. Oh, that wasn't tight. Gee, I wonder why. I'll use my hands on this. No seal. You don't need those. All right, now this is kind of tricky to get this out. I've done this before, and this, this part is not that great. I don't know how bad it is to go back in, but there we are. That wasn't too bad. Okay, now can we get the lines out? Oh, we're leaking. We're leaking a lot. Oh, gosh. It's a good thing that there's no... Nothing's lit around here. Alright, we're just gonna kick that out of the car. So here are the two fuel systems side by side. The bottom one is from my 2010 535 parts car, which I pulled these parts from. It's on my lot. And these appear to be original parts. They're in pretty good shape. You can see these both have the hump to go over the drive shaft inside the tank. And then that's the sending unit, which sends fuel to the front. Now this is the one from the car that we just pulled out. Now these are aftermarket replacement units, which there's nothing wrong with at all. However, um, it's a lot of money to spend to have somebody do this. What were you thinking? So this is what it's supposed to look like. Wait, no, it's this one. That's the one that's broken and missing. If that isn't there, it, it, it doesn't run. And guess what? The car doesn't run. So someone put some new parts in here and then I don't understand the thought process. However, we're gonna get this fixed. We're gonna put all these used parts in. I understand using some of these used seals and stuff is not ideal and I may revisit this later. I'm just trying to get the car running. Now this might be a little on the tricky side because I gotta get this over the hump inside the tank. I'm not sure how that's gonna work. I have to do that without breaking this either. Oh, this is going to be fun. Yep. Yep. Mike was right. This is going to be fun. Oh, why, are, why do you still have fuel in you? I, I drained you like four times. Oh my God, so much fuel. That's good for it. I'll clean that up in a minute. Come on. We almost had it. <laughs> this is not working. Let's try this again. And this time, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Oh yeah, that felt right, I think. I hear stuff on the other side of the tank. I don't think I can get, even get my arm in there. Not far enough. I got little arms for that. Seems to be snagged, snugged. Oh, I can get my arm in here. Oh look, I can tie. Oh, this is gonna be fun. No, no, ow. Great success. That wasn't too bad. It probably, the video probably makes it seem worse than it was. That was about 10 minutes. Okay, now that that is in place, we're gonna see if we can get this in its home. I think we can do that. I hope we can do that. There's like a special way that this goes in here. Like that. All right, we're gonna leave that sit like so. We're gonna mess with this over here, make sure that these are 
pulled through and everything made it okay. Let's see if I can shed some light on this situation. Oh, oh, just like so. But guess what? This time we're gonna put a seal in it because I'm about that marine life. Okay, seal in place. Get out of there, connector. We're not gonna get this quite snugged down yet. We're just gonna kinda do that number on it. We're gonna get the other side installed and then we'll tighten them both up at the same time. Now we can get the other side in. I remember this as being not that much fun from the last time I did one. These are notorious for cracking. They uh, split right here and spray fuel, cause a fuel leak and an evap leak. Connection made. Connection made. Electrical, all done. Not really. Still gotta get this whole thing crammed in here. It's fine. Would you look at it? Like a glove. Now we gotta put the seal in there again. Seal. I didn't know I should be using a used one. I mean, a new one. Wait, wait, did I double seal it? Oh, I almost double sealed it. You do that, you end up with extra kids. All right, where's the lock ring? Lock ring? Uh, lock ring? Where did you, where did thou go? What? Okay, hold on a moment, hold on a moment here. Okay, now we gotta tighten these buggers down. One hose, one electrical connector, and see if it runs. That's good enough. All right, that's good enough. I'm gonna need to revisit this anyway, put new seals in it. So I'm not freaking out about it being perfect. I just need it to run. Okay. So if my calculations are correct, this thing should fire right up. Okay, here goes something. I don't even know if the battery's strong enough to start it, but we shall see. It's not spraying fuel out back there, so that's good. wants to. Why is the fan on? Is this another bad high pressure fuel pump? What the heck? I need to get a jump box. Well, it's improvement. It's angry. It's so angry. Stay alive. Oh, it's idling on some number of cylinders. We're just gonna let it let it do its thing. It's camming hard. And maybe it'll smooth itself out, you know? Or stall. It could always do either one. Let's just turn it off. Let's get the scan tool. Try to figure out what's going on here. All right, sorry about the glare, guys, but 
I did get it running and it runs really rough, like it's running on four cylinders because it's throwing misfire codes for cylinders one and two. The good news about this is those are the front two, so this is the easiest to get to. So the next thing I'm going to do, instead of throwing parts at it, we're gonna swap the coils between one and two and three and four. We're gonna see if we get the same result or a different result. These are pretty simple. Okay. Well, that coil's been replaced. It's a cheapo aftermarket. Doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's cheap. Yep. All right, so we're gonna put that one in cylinder one, three to one, and four to two. Cans are all seated. Let's delete the codes. Erase. Yes. Okay. Let's start it up again. Well, it runs better. What is going on here? It still runs rough, but what is going on here? Some tomfoolery. There's no check engine light, it's running smooth. What is happening? Let's, um, let's see if it's starting to throw anything. No fault codes detected. Of course. So maybe they weren't seated? I don't know. They were replaced. I hate not knowing. I hate that. I can't tell you how much I hate that. Let's look at some live data. Injectors are super loud. Also, we're going to talk about the injectors in just a moment. Let's see. Oh, you're going to... Oh man, this thing's actually running pretty decent. All right, yeah, everything looks okay. Everything looks pretty okay. Let's um, let's go look at our fuel pressures here. Yeah, that's on the money. Boy, what a what an old man thing to say on the money. Who says that? It's still running a little rough. We'll get into that in a minute. We're not trying to restore this thing. I just I just want it to run and drive itself onto a trailer. That's that's the goal for tonight. Might even dare I say wash it? No, we gotta get the suspension aired up next. If possible. Alright, so now we're gonna go into the injectors because Anytime you replace injectors on an N54 powered vehicle, you have to code the injectors. And it's super simple. No. All right, so that's what's in there now. So cylinder one is 572245. Let's take a look at cylinder one. Well, that is not the numbers that they just said. So I'm gonna go ahead and recode all of these injectors and see if it runs any better. All right, now that the injectors are coated, let's see how it starts. Oh, it runs good. I mean, it runs as good as I could hope. That makes turbo noises. It has a bunch of warning lights. Replace brake pads, low fuel. 4x4, four four. let's see, do we have reverse? Oh yeah, oh it vibrates really badly, it's like it's got a bad motor mount. Park distance control, tire pressure, what else is wrong? What else is do, it's start off assistance inactive, daytime running light not working. SOS call system malfunction, increased battery discharge. What? Restraint system malfunction. Okay, we're running out of things to be wrong. Okay, the, the hatch just tried to close. Okay, we're good. Normal BMW stuff. We have one more thing to do before I put this on the trailer. I need to try to air the rear suspension up. This is a common problem on wagons and other BMWs with air, all cars with air suspension. 
When they sit for a long time, they have a slow leak and, well, it's not airing itself up. Now I went into my scan tool and I cannot, for some reason, turn the pump on. I can control the valves for the rear suspension, but I can't turn the pump on. So we're going to turn the pump on and if the pump's dead, then we're just going to have to load it like this. So the suspension compressor relay is where we're going first. And that is supposed to be, okay, locks, in this mess of stuff. Okay, there's a telematics unit. This is a disaster. This is going to take a hot minute to fix. I bet it's in here. What, what is going on here? I think that's it right there. Now we've got the module. That's the power hatch. This is less than ideal. Now I, I understand why they do this. These, these cars are really notorious for getting water in the back from leaking sunroof drains and then it fries all these electronics. And there's two ways to fix it. You can, I don't know, clean the drains out and keep it from happening or reactive things like this. All right, this get into this. Now they did a pretty good job sealing all this up. I am pretty impressed with the amount of time they spent. I mean, A for effort. I believe, oh, even more electrical tape. That's, that's more better. So what we're going to do, there's the relay. Nothing looks corroded, so that's good. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the case off of this relay we're going to actuate the relay ourselves. If the pump or the compressor turns on, we're good. If it doesn't, then we're kind of out of luck. Then it probably needs a compressor or it's got a wiring problem. But this comes apart pretty easy. Have the case off the relay. Now we're just going to carefully remember which way this goes. Did I do it right? Oh, that's. So now we need to check the fuse. That'll be the next stop. Okay, so the fuse for that compressor is this 40 amp right here. Instead of fishing that out of here, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just gonna make sure it's got power on both sides of the fuse. Okay, power. No power. Okay, so we got a bad 40 amp fuse. Let me go find a fuse. Where would I have a fuse? At a salvage yard. All right, just found a couple more fuses. Well, it's blown. Now it could just pop another fuse because there could be another problem, but it didn't. Now where did the relay go? The key is on. Let's see if we can be the relay here. No. Uh-oh. All right, let's check for power at both sides. Oh, it just blew the fuse. Okay. Well, it appears this car has a bad compressor or a short in the wiring. We're going to try it one more time just because I like blowing fuses. It's fun. Okay, so we're not getting this thing aired up. It's probably got a bad compressor. Gee, I don't know where I'd have a compressor. No, we're not doing that tonight. No, nope, no. I just need to get it on the trailer. It can look like I got a bunch of batteries in the trunk. It's fine. Well, you know we could. No, we're not doing this tonight. This could be another video in the future, but I do have one, which is kind of odd since I've only parted one of these cars out, which means that this part has been floating around my shop for three years now. Don't want to think about that. Okay, guys, this is, you know, I shouldn't have looked. This is definitely one of those situations I should have just, I should just let it be, but I just wanted to look towards the compressor just to see if I could see something and look at this unit. That is a Schrader valve. And I, I assume this is for airing up the suspension and you know we're gonna try this. So the compressor is located up here. It looks like someone uh, gained access. That's the best way I could describe it. There's a bunch of hokey stuff going on there. Uh, compressor's probably bad. It's fine. We're going to see if we can air this up with uh, the compressor here. That I 
I can't believe I'm looking at this under a BMW. An S10, sure, but this? What you need to do is get all the dirt and the road crap out of the valve. Okay, and then, this, I, I, this can't work. This, this just can't be a thing. I mean, it could be a thing. I don't believe it, but. It's not moving, is it? Maybe I don't have it all the way on. Let's try it now. Oh, it doesn't work? You mean this? This doesn't work? Are you kidding? Color me surprised. But boy, that would have been pretty cool if it did. Yeah, nothing's happening. Should I look into it further? Should I? Anything else? Any other kind of malarkey going on under here? Let me see if this valve is good. I can't believe I'm trying to fix this. Let's try this one more time. I don't think that's working. I don't even know how this is connected. I don't want to know how this is connected. I could try something. Why am I putting the time into this? Oh wow, it still has a jack pad. Now I'm impressed. See if we just give it a hand, you know? No. No. I mean, I like where their head's at. It's just not, it doesn't work. Oh well, it was worth the endeavor. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. Wait, no, I'm trailering it. Now I'm gonna give it a quick bath. Can't drag home another BMW that's dirty. My neighbors, what will they think if I bring home a dirty BMW? But another random clean BMW, no problem. So I'm gonna give it a quick power wash. I'm not really gonna wash it. I'm just gonna knock all the dirt off of it, take the stickers and the writing off of it and then load it on the trailer. I think that was a success. Anytime you buy a car from the auction, you're assuming some risk. There have been plenty of cars that I bought that were wrecked, completely destroyed in the front end or dismantled, made it look like it's been in an accident and it turns out the engine's bad. It's got a dead cylinder or maybe it's got a hole in the block, completely unrelated to the accident. Transmission's bad. I even have a 335 on my lot with 95,000 miles on it that had a trunk fire. Also has a hole in the piston from someone breaking a spark plug when they did a spark plug change. Smells like insurance fraud. That stuff happens. That's what the auction is. Now there's plenty of good deals. I've gotten lots of them. And as long as you win more than you lose, I think you're doing okay. Now this car was a risk also, but it was a calculated one. I'm $1,700 all in on this car. I know you guys like it when I tell you guys what I've got in something. 1700 bucks includes transport, fees, everything that I have invested in this car up to this point. And it is not ready to drive. Not even, not even close. But let's talk about the level of work that was done to this car. Now, I love DIY guys. I'm a DIY guy. I, I love that stuff. But there are some things people know better. And I don't really like seeing some of the repairs on this car. I've seen it before. This is not really the type of car that you can get away with that kind of stuff. These cars are very terrible cars to own if you don't know how to work on cars. It's, I, I do not recommend these whatsoever unless you like them and you know how to wrench or at least have a friend that does. So I knew what I was getting into. I knew this car was going to be a whole bag of trouble. I, I just knew it, but I still still bought it because this is... This is just what I do. I have some pretty big plans for this car. Unfortunately, it's gonna be a long time before I can get to it. This car is gonna sit next to my garage under a car cover, probably until late spring, early summer. And that's just the way, that's just the way it is. I've got too many other cars that are a much higher priority than a duplicate to what I already own. Some of those plans include converting it to two wheel drive and a manual transmission. They never offered them this way in North America and I, I kind of wish they did. Now, this has nothing to do with how bad or good BMW's X-Drive system is. It's pretty good, it's pretty reliable, transfer case needs fluid change on a regular basis and nobody ever does it, and they have shift selector motors. Anyway, they're pretty good, 
But if you've ever driven a BMW xDrive car and then its two-wheel drive counterpart, there is a definitive difference in the way the cars drive. The front suspension on an xDrive car is steel and they are notorious for rusting out, whereas a two-wheel drive car is aluminum. The front suspension geometry is different and the two-wheel drive cars just feel a lot more solid, a lot more nimble. These feel great. It has nothing to do with this feeling terrible. I just prefer the way the two-wheel drive cars are. Plus, it'll be like 250, maybe 300 pounds lighter. I really hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.